All right. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the panelists for the second panel, which is the role of cultural institution in building livable environments or livable places. Um, this time, I'm going to simply introduce everybody and then sit down, and Mr. David Fisher will moderate the conversation. Uh, again, as my habit goes, I'll start from left. The first panelist to your left and my right, Ms. Karen Brosius, Executive Director, Columbia Museum of Art. Karen has worked in all facets of arts management and outreach and is passionate about all of the uh, opportunities that museums have to offer. In 2006, she received a White House appointment to serve on the board of the Institute of, Institute of Museums and Library Services in Washington, DC, the largest federal funder of museums and libraries in America. Karen has collaborated nationally and internationally to support artists and engage the public in arts education. I also want to congratulate Karen on a recent recognition. Two days ago, Columbia Museum of Art was selected as national medal finalist for Museum of Museum and Library Services. Finalists are chosen because, chosen because of their significant and exceptional contributions to their community. Congratulations, Karen. <laughs> Ms. Janine Torano, representing Tacoma Art Museum, is the owner of Topio Technology Inc., a successful technology company in Tacoma, but it is her passion for building community that inspires and drives Janine's volunteer efforts. She served more than 10 years at the Tacoma Art Museum as a trustee, as board president, and as co-chair of the museum's uh, building committee for the $15.5 million Hub Family Galleries expansion. She now serves again in that capacity for the new Benario Wing Project. Mr. David Fisher, Executive Director, Broadway Center for the Performing Arts in Tacoma, has focused Tacoma's historical, historic theaters on strengthening community relevance, more than doubling the bu annual budget and increasing educational services to 45,000 annually. David currently serves on the UW Tacoma School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences Advisory Board, the Western Arts Alliance's Advisory Board, CODA, and Cultural Access Washington. And during the last few months, he keeps seeing me all the time because we're serving on a very important committee together. So thank you for that as well, David. Amy McBride, Ms. Amy McBride is Tacoma Arts Administrators for the City of Tacoma, works with the Tacoma Arts Commission. Amy manages three funding programs for arts organizations and artists, implements public art projects, develops innovative and collaborative programming and formulates effective policy with the goal of creating a fertile ecosystem of a thriving community. Ms. Susan Colton, last but not least. Luma Consulting offers a strategic council to philanthropists, foundations, and nonprofits to help them deepen their impact in the communities they serve. She spent 15 years heading the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, where she oversaw original na regional, national, international grant-making programs, aligning donor vision with results and designing new initiatives in science education and the arts and building nonprofit capacity through research, workshops, and convening. Please help me welcome them, and we will listen to what they have to offer. David. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. I am at the, at the, at the invitation of Stephanie Stiebich, who is the director of the Tacoma Art Museum, and I want to thank her for inviting me to come today and talk to you about how the Columbia Museum of Art has become part of the placemaking community in America. I have a number of slides that I'm going to go through very quickly, but I'm going to show you how we have evolved as an institution. This picture is a picture currently of the Columbia Museum of Art. Uh, it's one of the earliest examples in Columbia of architectural adaptive reuse. It used to be a department store. This is the museum at night with banners outside. This is a sample of the galleries. We, our collection is American, European, Asian, and modern and contemporary art. And we have outdoor sculpture on our plaza. 
What is wrong with all of those pictures? No people. When this museum opened in 1998, we opened with a bang and then the museum sort of went to sleep. And as a result, we came in and decided, and I started in 2004, the museum opened in 98. We said, we have to bring people back to downtown and downtown Main Street in Columbia. Museums have changed their role dramatically, I think, over the last decade. For many years, we have been institutions that have collected artwork, exhibited artwork, interpreted artwork, but it was really about the object. It wasn't as much about you, the community, and the people that we're trying to serve. So we have flipped that paradigm on its head, and we are now becoming a people-oriented institution with art as the vehicle to tell that story. And education for us is at the very, very core of our mission. It's why we exist. We're all about partnerships and innovation. We realize we can't do it ourselves. Our museums are a fabric of the community. But one of my favorite math equations is one plus one equals three. And that means we can do more together than we can separately. We also, Columbia, South Carolina is the biggest city in South Carolina. It has about a whopping 125,000 people. Charleston has 120,000. The whole state only has 4 million people. But so for us, to put that in context, for us to receive this National Medal Finalist Award of, of only 15 museums in the country, and to be seen on the national and international stage, this shows the power of cultural institutions in making a difference and being relevant to their community. In terms of tourism and attendance, so now you know we have about 4 million people in the state. We touch North Carolina, we touch Georgia to the south and west. We've had 1.3 million people in 10 years. Uh, our attendance and outreach last year was 160,000. When I started, um, it was 33,000 a year. So we have really mushroomed. And we're also looking to do a balance of tourism and community members. And part of that I'll talk about in a minute. We are viewed quite dramatically by the community, by the business community, and by government officials as a city center asset. We are not only a cultural anchor, we are now, we were seen in 1998 as a cultural catalyst. City Center Partnership, on whose board I served, is the business organization of business leaders. And I got myself a seat at that table because I said, I have a retail shop. I am a business as well. I didn't want them to think of us as just a nonprofit institution, but more holistically in what we offer. This is another example of our our activities that we continue to draw in a broad a range of people from the community. And we even have, and this is the most amusing thing, if you ever can come in the winter, to come to South Carolina and see people skate. It is the most amusing thing. They skate, uh, on, this is in front of the museum, this is a big fountain sculpture we have, and they come and skate and they absolutely love it and it has revitalized the downtown in ways that we could never have imagined, particularly in the winter. Um, where it is relatively cool. It's about a whopping 40 degrees. I know that's very typical for you, but for South Carolina, that's a little chilly. And remember that picture before where you saw the sculpture um, and no one there? Here you now see people just having fun, interacting with art, public art, and being feeling very comfortable. I love what the earlier panel said, and they're feeling comfortable in being in this public space. And we really want this to be a place for them to just discover. This is an artist, Alvin Spahn, and he's talking about the uh, artist Charles White in our current exhibition called Remix, African American Artists and Themes and Variations. And here he's leading a tour and talking about the importance of what the arts bring to our community. And this is a terrible picture, but it's showing a jazz concert at night. Um, we're not just about visual art, but we're about all the arts. We have concerts and lectures, dance performances. Uh, in the center is one of the leading artists in Colombia. It's a chance for her to also talk about the work and lead discussions. 
Uh, we have developed a program for uh, young professionals called Arts and Drafts. It's not only just about beer tasting and getting together, but it's coming together as an intensely social ex ex experience for people to come and do art together and go through the galleries together and have a wonderful time. And the final slide is to just share with you that we believe very, very passionately that we're a place for visitors in our community to come together, to be a part of the community, and to share their feelings, emotions, and connections with us on a daily basis. So thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Janine Tirano. Um, by day, I, I own a technology company, as was mentioned, and I just want to take a minute and encourage everybody to be an absolute champion of arts and cultural institutions. Uh, you know, it's true that we make decisions on hiring and we look for engineers that have backgrounds in uh, arts and music because it tends to make them uh, more critical, th better critical thinkers. Uh, but this notion that arts and cultural institutions only exist because they make us better at math and science is a little misguided. It's, it's like saying Leonardo da Vinci existed only to make Copernicus a better astronomer. <laughs> it's not the case. So we have to be fierce advocates because arts and culture uh, enrich our lives. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the Tacoma Art Museum, something I love very much, near and dear to my heart. Um, we are located right downtown, and now I have to work the technology piece here. <laughs> so if you'll notice, uh, we've got a, a very um, inviting front to our building, and this was intentional. We really looked at where the museum was seated in downtown, and we wanted to uh, embrace the connective tissue to connect those pockets of success, the University of Washington, Tacoma, um, up and down Pacific, to really encourage a more walkable city. And we viewed the entrance as a gathering space. We want to bring people together. So the history of Tacoma didn't start out in downtown Tacoma, but I want to take a moment and just show this aerial view of what we call the uh, museum district. And we're super fortunate in Tacoma. We have the LeMay Museum, we have the History Museum, we have the Museum of Glass, we have the Children's Museum, we have the Tacoma Art Museum, we have a wonderful performing arts center as well. And, you know, this is unheard of, really, to have all of this in a downtown area. And it's a fantastic asset for the city, and I um, hope that our city continues to recognize that and promote that. Um, but the, the actual story of the Tacoma Art Museum started in 1935, and this is a fine example of what happens when people get together and they share a vision and they share a commitment. Uh, this started out as a volunteer organization. Uh, it started at, with the University of Puget Sound. That connection continues today. Uh, there's a, a very much a focus around the arts. We, there's still a gallery at the, at the University of Puget Sound. And then we decided that it was time to move into downtown. We went to the Broadway, uh, uh, Broadway Street address. And at this point, we were actually, on one side of us was a Bible store, and on the other side was a liquor store. <laughs> it, it's proof that art is for everybody. <laughs> <We've> <laughs> we then moved further down Pacific. Um, it was at this point that uh, we were really in the heart of downtown. And this is when the organization started to take on more of a professional structure to it. Then we moved into a, a former bank building. Uh, we were there for 30 years. And again, this, this is a continuation of the story of great people seeing great things and making great things happen. When we were in this location, uh, the board decided that they would take on an exhibition associated with the uh, Moscow Treasures uh, Goodwill Games. And there was a Russian exhibition called, I think it was called uh, Between, uh, Between Summer, um, if I recall correctly. And that exhibition, the cost of that exhibition, equaled the annual budget for that museum. And that group of individuals got together and said, we can do this. We can go out and we can generate uh, interest in the community and we can bring that here and, and make a difference. And they did. So that vision continued. Uh, the next step was to find a permanent home. And that's at 1701 
uh, Pacific Avenue, right in the heart of where the uh, Prairie Line Trail comes in. You know, we just have this great connection in downtown. And there's a lot of great statistics around what the Tacoma Art Museum does. And as far as contributing to livability, um, you know, we have over a half million visitors have come through our door. Uh, we've had over, you know, thousands of students. We have community festivals that are uh, hugely attended. And, you know, it's our mission to connect people through art. And it's about bringing people together. It's about honoring the human condition and helping us address challenges that are in our lives. We just have to look at our presidential race to understand those challenges. Um, but it's really about providing a diverse lens so that we can see uh, through different eyes, cultures and ideas and conditions and things that matter to us and things that we might be discovering for the first time. And that's what we do. That's, I think, what we're here today to talk about. And where we make differences in our communities and where we make communities uh, really thrive is when we come together and understand and participate. And that's really what Tacoma Art Museum is all about. Thank you. As the guy who uh, represents uh, performing arts, I am uh, not going to use media. Uh, <laughs> we are all about the ethereal moment, the moment in time that is real right here, right now. We breathe the same air and connect with our imagination and our ideas. When I think about what is uh, the role of arts and culture in making livable cities, it makes me want to grapple with, well, what are cities and what are arts? And so, uh, forgive me, but here's my thoughts on both of those. Cities, for me, are places of uh, density, places with multiplicity of activities, a beehive uh, center of transactions, of work, worship, and wonder and the pollination that happens uh, across uh, each of us as our bees that we are uh, is what energizes and makes uh, real the life of cities. Arts begin with a blank canvas or an empty stage. And from there, it is an opportunity for the artist to step into their sense of curiosity, their sense of discovery, and their unique capacity to assemble disparate ideas and challenging ideas into a whole, into a story that is an impactful nugget and breaks through to connect us, breaks through our alienation of modern life, breaks through the aloneness and connects us to our humanity and to one another. So if you have those two environmental uh, pieces going on and they're merging together with arts in cities, well, what happens? Well, there's a conduit that gets created. There's that moment when an audience is sitting elbow to elbow with their neighbors whom they may not know, who are distinctly different from them and the lights go down and we are in the dark, one of the most vulnerable places we can be. <laughs> and again, we're breathing that same air, that same moment, that same energy and the spotlight comes up, the artist comes out and makes that invitation to step into their worldview. And that then exercises an underused muscle in us called empathy. And to me, that is the, that's what gets me up every morning. And that unlocking of empathy, that uh, exercising uh, of our humanity is what happens when the artist connects with their audience. And with that an amazing capacity to connect, then we're breaking down, constantly breaking down the projection of other that we put on our fellows 
and breaks down that division in society, the silos that we like to create, whether class-driven or otherwise. But with that comes a huge responsibility that we offer our blank canvases and our empty stages to a wild diversity of our citizenry. And it is that multiplicity of voices then. By the way, uh, the Pantages, which is our flagship uh, theater here in uh, the Performing Arts Center, is an old vaudeville house. Vaudeville, vaudeville in French, is voice of the city. And that, I think, is such a wonderful way of thinking about the arts and how they connect. And so for centuries, really, arts patronage has come from the very tip top. And it's been an ongoing gift of the elite to energize and fund the arts. Unfortunately, with that has come a sense of exclusion and division. And so in contemporary life, I think the arts role in cities is to break down that division, to make sure that we are living and breathing a sense of stitching together the social fabric of who we are in our democracy, representing all. Tell you, the Broadway Center is in a unique position because we manage city-owned buildings. They are citizen-owned assets. And therefore, we take responsibility very seriously to represent the whole and do everything that we can to include and serve uh, a diverse community. And we do that in a whole bunch of different ways. We've hosted over the last decade uh, well over a dozen uh, community dialogues where we bring together diverse community and say, look, we haven't been doing a good job of serving you. What do you want to see? How will you feel we are authentically welcoming you into these buildings? What do you need? And we've listened and we've changed how we operate. And out of that has come a wild diversity of programs, and services. We focus on uh, our education programs. Uh, we have a program that is an anti-bullying and socialization program called LENS, stands for Learning Empathy Negotiation Sense of Self. We have a program called the, culture, uh, the uh, Civil Rights Legacy Tour, which uh, invites uh, us commissioning small plays, go out to school, serves about 15,000 students, and focuses on our deep heritage of civil rights in this country. And we just recently got a grant from OSPI uh, and uh, honoring uh, Kip Takuda. And the next of our four plays in this uh, program will be around Japanese internment and the civil rights implications of that. And then there's the business aspect of who we are. We're the largest retailer in downtown Tacoma. Our box office uh, is incredibly busy, uh, has more than $3 million uh, in revenues that flow through it. We're serving 240,000 people a year in the theater district and have an economic impact of $18 million a year. So I believe that uh, there is a way for us to be socially inclusive and uh, serve the whole and be successful economically. Thank you. Can I have the clicker? Can I have the clicker? The clicker. So unlike David, I'm gonna mesmerize you with a bazillion images. Um, and I'm doing this on purpose. They're just gonna scroll behind me while I'm talking talking, I'm not going to exactly speak to them um, because a picture tells a thousand words. I like to start with the photographs of Stephen Chichewski that he took in Tacoma in the late 70s and early 80s to remind us where, how far we've come and, and in such short a time. So representing the city of Tacoma, um, the Arts Division is located within the Community and Economic Development Department, and uh, we like to see how the arts can be used in as many ways as possible to address and impact a variety of civic issues. The cultural institutions, of course, are, are, are instrumental in providing to what I consider our cultural ecosystem, and I want to speak to you a little bit about what 
um, that framework of what is a, a thriving cultural ecosystem. Because I think if we have a flourishing creative ecosystem, we have a flourishing community. And I think that's the antidote to what some might consider or what could be a problem with um, cultural elitism. If our, if our creative culture is thriving, it's going to be there for everybody in a variety of ways. But what does that look like? You know, we're talking about physical, social, and economic impacts. And there are five, five determinants that I sort of use to look at how we develop policy or do programming. And, and one of those is, is access. So in this flourishing creative e ecosystem in Tacoma or wherever, there are many different points of entry where people can make and experience art. So that gets to geographic equity. I can go in my neighborhood and, and experience a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing public space. I can find, go to take ballet and, and down the street, and I can come downtown and go to the larger institutions, or there are other things, you know, just anywhere and everywhere that geographic equity. Venues, it comes to, it um, goes to affordability. I can always find something that I, that I can attend. And there are different levels of, of entry, from beginning, but also to mastery. I think sometimes we get in, in the arts this, this um, dichotomy between beginners and everybody's an artist, and but wait, I'm a, I'm a master. And, and those, there needs to be that continuum, and we need to have communities where people can enter, but also be professional. And that gets to prosperity, communities where artists can live and make a living. So it may be in their art, it may be at another job that they, we have enough that employ them so that they can continue to, to, to do and make art, um, either as a professional or an amateur. And the arts are integrated into many systems, and this is the part where being having the position in a city city government is is essential, or any government, in that we can access planning, uh, culture, arts and cultural vitality are one of the seven strategies in, in Tacoma 2025, our 10-year strate strategic plan, and then having allies in our planning department to help um, <laughs> bug bug them and them bug me to to get strategies within the comprehensive plan is essential, and then be, being able to do planning on our own is important. Um, converging with transportation systems, of course, the built environment. And um, many of my colleagues have referred to partnerships. Of course, we have partnerships with our cultural institutions and artists, but we also have partnerships with, with non-arts agencies, with UWT, with the Tacoma Housing Authority, with Metro Parks. And we're, we're lucky to be in a community where we kind of can knock on the door of our neighbor and say, hey, you want to engage the arts in this way? We can, we can help you do that. And then the other piece that I think is so important is is risk taking, being a community that's willing to take risks, that has a tolerance, even a welcomes ambiguity and, and controversy. And that, that comes to bear when we invite community to engage in public process that could affect design. If we ask artists to help us hear from the community and have that Im, Im influence how we end up doing something, can we tolerate what they actually come up with? Do we really mean it? Um, if we have artists that are speaking their mind and protesting, can we hear it? Can we respond to it? And, um, you know, because I think so much in the arts, there's so much fear. Like, what's it going to look like? Or, oh, that could be controversial. Well, ha bring it on. You know, that's what I say. <laughs> so, at the city of Tacoma, I mean, there, and this is true for, for most, we do these things by policy. So the Arts Commission exists. As, it's a policy that cities have commissions. Um, we have certain things like percent for art funding that, that has public art within the built environment. Um, we fund we fund organizations and artists and small grassroots to help build that ecosystem of different players within our community. We also seek funding to help supplement what, what the city um, does. Our public art program was reestablished in 2001 after being killed in the 80s from a major controversy that wasn't too tolerable with the Tacoma Dome. I don't need to get into that story, but um, you know, public art is not just the the guy on the horse. It's it and it isn't just the sculpture in the park or the whatever. It's an opportunity for artists to engage in community in a meaningful way. And, and to the earlier conversation to say, how do we do that community engagement? Look to artists, they're good at it. Many of them are um, do it all the time and are able to, to do some of those pieces. It's also, we've used public art as a way to train our local artists to build capacity and um, be able to give them the skill sets to, to uh, continue to be competitive in the larger region. Um, 
We also do program development, so Arts Month is every October, and that's a way where the city creates a platform into which ev anybody and everybody who does anything arts-related that month gets, we, we market and program, that, or market it for them, so they get visibility. We show critical mass. It's now it's, its 14th year when it started. There were maybe 50 events and, and 12 artists on the studio tour that I had to call up myself, and um, now we exceed 400 events a, a month. So it's, so it's a really a barometer that reflects the, the activity in the community. Um, and then we can be really innovative too sometimes. And I want to, I hope we get to talk a little bit more in the question and answer about SpaceWorks Tacoma because I think this hits on a lot of the conversations that were happening earlier. This was started as a way to activate empty storefronts. Um, but looking at um, really, because we've been doing um, installations at the Woolworth windows for 10 years already. So I was looking at what are our assets with our creative community and casting the net? Who are they? What are those good ideas out there? How do we find them? And, and partnering with um, private property owners to convince them to give us a uh, free space that we could connect these, these creative enterprises with was sort of a carrot. Um, and continues to be, but it's, it's, it's a program that's developed to really be a, a meaningful training program for creative enterprise. They go through the training, we place them in space. Some of the spots, we, uh, businesses we placed um, have been in their places, uh, in their locations for five years now. Um, one of our recent um, alum just bought his own building, um, but it's incrementally growing our own planting them in neighborhoods, transforming community on so many levels. And now we're working closer with our housing division and community development block grant money to buy those buildings that we can then place these authentic businesses in and look at co-working spaces. And because we have six years of this, there's 80 creative enterprises that are in this cohort. And it's, it's there's possible, but it, it, it took risk taking, it took partnering with the Chamber of Commerce and, and doing things in a different way. And my time is up, so I'm gonna stop talking, but ask questions about it later, because I, <laughs> I wanna tell you more. <laughs> We do want to hear more about SpaceWorks Tacoma, so Thank I'm going to plant your question. Um, so I'm Sue Colleton. I'm the vice chair of the Washington State Arts Commission, and it's really the, my commissioner hat that I'm wearing today. And I wanted to talk to you about several public policy initiatives that are in process that are, that are directly related to making our communities more livable through the arts. Um, we started talking about this concept of livability a few weeks ago uh, when we started to plan for this, this panel. And, and I have to say that my image of urban livability really comes from a textbook that we used in the late 80s when I was studying urban planning. And this was a book called A Pattern Language. I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with it. I subsequently ended up majoring in art history, but, but A Pattern Language <laughs> continues to be central on my bookshelf because it, it really influenced how I think about livable communities. In the book, the authors define an ideal environment, um, and, and an environment they, they consider could be a city, it could be a neighborhood, it could be a building, any kind of built environment. The ideal built environment is one that makes people feel alive and human, and I love that. And they list within the book hundreds of attributes of how you make people feel alive and human, and among them are architecture and spaces that are built at a human scale, they don't want to see anything built more than four stories high. Identifiable neighborhoods where people can create energy and character. Local centers which have promenades and activity nodes. Small public spaces where people can gather to hear music or to dance. They actually have a chapter called Dancing in the Streets. I love this because it's really, um, where's Mark? It, it, it really speaks to this idea of a shared living room. It's, it's the same concept. They talk about the importance of pedestrian density and a network of learning opportunities throughout the city. They want to see the cityscape as a curriculum so that you can learn things in the, in the, on the street front. And the way that you do that, the, the key ways to learn that is through museums, galleries, science centers, and libraries. So I, these really resonate with me and they continue to resonate with me. And so I wanted, oh good, okay. I wanted to talk about several public policy initiatives that, that are, really supporting livability because they're gonna help organizations sustain themselves over the long term by helping them to engage larger and more diverse audiences and also providing some new public funding streams. This legislation is gonna help our cultural organizations work together to attract visitors funding and attract attention to their distinct neighborhoods. 
and also improve the physical environment through the creation of new public artworks at a human scale. The most significant of these initiatives is Kawa. We've heard a little bit about it already. David's been involved in Cultural Access Washington. In July of 2015, this new law passed. It authorizes any single county or a group of contiguous counties in Washington state to ask voters to approve a tax of up to 0.1%, either a property tax or sales tax, to support access to cultural, scientific, and heritage organizations. Now that the law has passed, the next step is for counties across the state to decide whether they're gonna put it on the ballot, and once they put it on the ballot, it's gonna be up to the voters to approve those, those taxes. If passed, these funds are gonna support a public school access program, which includes supporting art and culture programs within schools, and also transportation and providing access to those students to the local arts and science organizations. It'll also provide programming and operational support for large and small uh, museums, galleries, science organizations, aquariums, et cetera. If a county chooses not to implement this program, then a city within that county can step into their shoes, and so they can implement a program, put it on the ballot within their metropolitan district. Based on its tax base, King County can generate $52 million annually for its arts and culture organizations. The county is planning to place this on the ballot in November 2017, and between now and that date, it'll be generating a, a public campaign to get enough voter support to, to pass the bill. I know there was a rumor that Olympia was gonna put it on a ballot this November, but I understand that's not the case, maybe the case, we're not sure. Um, and Pierce County is not going to be putting something on the countywide ballot, and therefore Tacoma City can put something on its ballot, and I know it's looking at November 2018 for, for doing that. Um, Tacoma, I think based on the, the tax base right now, can raise between four and five million dollars annually for its cult, art and cultural activity. So this bill is based on several successful models around the country. I know, I think there's one in, in South Carolina that, that uh, Karen might talk about. Um, I believe that this is game-changing legislation because this is putting new money into the art sector. Um, there are some problems, some tensions about it that I think we'll talk about during the, the conversation, but coming into the new economy, arts and cultural organizations are struggling. The traditional art patrons are disappearing, the audiences are younger, their behaviors are different, and marketing and communications are completely different. And while the larger organizations are able to respond to these changes, the mid-size and the small organizations just don't have the capital to invest in themselves and invest in new systems to be able to respond. Um, this legislation is going to bring new money into the system. It's going to help to sustain them. And, and these are the institutions that bring our cities to life. So I think it's really critical that, that, that we support this. The second bill that I have listed up here is the Creative Districts Bill. This is House Bill 2583. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with creative or cultural districts. We've talked a little bit about them here. Um, communities have densities of creative areas, whether it's museums or theaters or artists that are living there, and they have used this designation in the past to generate more activity and more attention. Typically, creative districts are attractive places to live, uh, to do business, to work, and it, more business because of the, the pedestrian density generates economic health. The goal behind this bill is to put in place a state-certified creative district program, and the Washington State Arts Commission will provide technical and professional support to communities wishing to establish creative districts. They will certify the districts, and they'll provide small grant opportunities to, to communities to launch their districts. Um, it passed the House a couple weeks ago, 90 to 8. Um, there's bipartisan support for this bill, and we, we're, we're feeling pretty good about uh, its ability to pass. Finally, I've got uh, another one up there that's, that's currently active in, in, at the House. It's uh, Senate, Bill, sorry, Senate Bill 6409. It allows for allocating 10% of a percent for art allocation for design work. And what it'll enable us to do is bring artists in early to the process so they can work with the design team on the project rather than creating work that responds to a design that already exists. Um, again, there's a lot of support. We haven't had any pushback on this, but unfortunately, it's a piece of a much larger bill that does have some problems. So we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed on that one, but, um, but we're not sure it's going to get through, but, but um, hopefully it will. Thank you very much. I'm out of time, and I'll turn it over to David. Thank you, panel. Uh, 
will ask you to uh, line up at the microphones and uh, ask any questions. And as you do, I'm going to turn and uh, get the panel going here with a question. And I've been in Tacoma on and off, mostly on, uh, since 1994. And I have seen a significant change in attitude. It used to be uh, Tacoma Tacomans uh, responded to living here a little bit like Groucho Marx's old line. I wouldn't want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member, in that our self-esteem was uh, a little dampened. And we were always comparing ourselves to our neighbor to the north. Now, uh, I have felt for many, many years uh, of late that uh, people are responding, hell no, we don't want to be Seattle. Uh, we want to be uh, ourselves. And so I turn to you. What do you think the arts, and whether it's in Columbia or uh, elsewhere, how do you think the arts are building a sense of community pride and self-esteem uh, within community? Um, I, I'd just like to take a, a brief moment to build on that and take you back 150 years. In February 2015, our city was burned to the ground by General Sherman. And believe it or not, 150 years is only about four generations. And it had very positive effects, but then you think about we had Reconstruction, then we had the Great Depression. Uh, we didn't have air conditioning, so no businesses would move to the South until the mid-1950s. Then we had civil rights in the 1960s. So it really was about 100 years after the end of the Civil War that the South finally got a toehold to move forward. So we see cultural institutions as being absolutely essential to the new South, to being the new hot spot, no pun intended, um, but to be a part of a vibrancy. I, I do know having been a New Yorker for 25 years, um, you, people who don't live in the South look at the South as sort of a poor stepsister. And um, people do make jokes ab about it in South Carolina. And it, it kind of goes back to what David was saying. Every city has that inferiority complex. Philadelphia has it with New York. Baltimore has it with Philadelphia. Um, and so we all try to figure that out. So how we take it, um, we have the first African-American mayor in our history. He is fantastic. And he is taking us to the next level. And his commitment to arts and culture has turned the city around. So I would ad advocate for what Sue talked about, for what Janine talked about. Get your political will and the capital in your savings bank and use it. Because if you don't use it, then it's a wasted opportunity. For us in South Carolina, we see it as the way to economic development. Business, businesses think they can't come to South Carolina because they think they don't have the educational workforce that they need. But to turn that on its head, we have the largest car business in the, in the country with Michelin, Volvo, um, um, BMW. They're all headquartered in South Carolina. Um, and, and more and more businesses are coming. So we're being able to challenge that notion that we are not an educated uh, part of the country. So my, 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 my complete message is you need to get that through because the hospitality tax that we benefited from for 10 years, 12 years, was put through by the mayor and the county council. And that has provided us with that stable source of funding to build from. That's why we had 33,000 people before. We had no stable base and no long-term planning tool. Plus, we're in the South where there's no money in general. I mean, we're not like here. We have, no, we have one Fortune 500 company in the whole state. Texas has 54 headquartered, we have one. So we don't have a lot of wealthy people in our state. We are all about community and it's one by one by one that we will build the state back. I think that's great parallels for Tacoma where we don't have major corporations here uh, as well. Um, anybody else want to talk about uh, raising self-esteem through cultural activities? Yeah, David, I'll comment just a, a little bit. I think that, you know, one of the things that I uh, appreciate the most about our arts and culture is it really does open up conversation about difficult topics. 
Um, and it does it in a way that's safe and engaging and inclusive. Um, you know, we've had a, a, a wide variety of exhibitions at the Tacoma Art Museum that's ranged from, you know, Art Aids America to St. John's Bible, Norman Rockwell to Hide Seek. You know, and, they, and these exhibitions tend to uh, appeal to different people with different viewpoints. And where we know that there's great progress being made is when sometimes it is a little bit thought-provoking and challenging and people can come together and in this safe environment actually learn something new and share their own ideas. And I think it's, it's those opportunities that are presented by arts and cultural institutions that foster an understanding um, is what's so critical. And that self-esteem is a big component of that because you're no longer alienated. You feel like you've been heard, like what you believe is honored. And, and that's really where great progress is made. I'd love to add to that conversation. So um, I'm not from, I'm from the Midwest, so the Seattle-Tacoma thing has never really been my, I don't care. Um, but I, I did live in Seattle before coming to Tacoma, and it was the Tacoma Art Museum and their old bank building that drew me down here in the first place because there were some amazing shows. And it was enough to look around, even, and to see the University of Washington Tacoma and the investment, and like, something's happening here. And I'd lived in San Francisco and Washington, D.C., and other places, or even Seattle, where they said, oh, if only you'd been here when you could do this stuff. I'm like, I want to be in the place where I get to say, I got my house for $103,000. <laughs> um, so, so culture drew me to Tacoma. Um, I was fortunate enough to get employed by the city after, after I moved here. Um, but and, I, and it was on the, few, on the on my enthusiasm. So I was of that wave in 1998 that was like, are you kidding me? You have this amazing housing stock and the view and all this great stuff that we all say, yeah. Um, and, and, but it was that, you know, palpable, that self-esteem issue. So, you know, living on that, like, oh, Tacoma has so much potential. There's so much potential. <laughs> so much po and I had an epiphany about eight years ago, and I want to share this with you if you have not heard me say this a million times already, is that potential is a creative space. What better than potential to make amazing things happen? And to come as like this creative lab, and people connect together, and you have access to our mayor and to our the executive directors of our institutions and the artists and all these things. And, and I've been able to make things happen just because nobody knew what I was doing. Yeah, like, they didn't hear, like, okay, go put installations in some empty windows. Okay, go ahead. I don't know what you're talking about. But um, I think that, that, that turning that on its head and saying, okay, okay, potential is a place where anybody who comes to this town and rolls up their sleeves and has a good idea and push it, can make it happen. And that is what's so exciting about this community. I don't, I, I, I tend to hear the, certainly some people still have it, but it's a lot of that self-esteem stuff is pushed from the outside, which is irritating. I, I had an interview with a uh, a news source interviewing about SpaceWorks, and they're like, so are you just doing this to be more like Seattle? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Ah, you know, so pushing that back too. Anyway, potential is a creative space. Well, I'm gonna talk about Seattle. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, when I, when I think about um, sense of community and, and self-esteem, I think about my neighborhood of Capitol Hill in Seattle. And when I moved into Capitol Hill, it was really on the decline. There were a lot of empty storefronts. There were people moving out. And there wasn't a lot of energy in the street. And uh, if you've been up there recently, you know it's just there's a verve on the street that is so exciting. And I think one of the reasons we've been successful in doing that is that intentionally we've kept the low income, the mixed income housing that has kept artists in the neighborhood. We've developed small performing arts venues for artist-driven organizations to present so that there are you know, black boxes and 300 seat and 150 seat venues where they can, that they can fill and they can, they can be successful in. And um, it has added a lot. The density of those spaces and keeping those artists in the neighborhood has, has really enabled the neighborhood to, um, to bounce back and um, it's a little crazy right now. <laughs> I'm taking my moderator hat off, putting my panelist hat on and gonna say um, that one of the powerful things that uh, a group of us are working on, I think, in town is to give that uh, opportunity for residents to message their pride in this community and give them frameworks and language and ideas to do so. Because we are the best marketers for our communities and it shouldn't all be on the shoulders of the Visitors Convention Bureau and the Economic Development Department. So we're pushing things out. My little way of doing that on Facebook, there's a, a 
phenomenal group of uh, photographers in Tacoma who have galvanized on a page called Awesome Tacoma. So if you are not yet uh, friends with that, please do that. And I'm reposting incredible photos of Tacoma and just saying, this is Tacoma. Get that other crap out of your head. This is who we are and what we look like. And I encourage all of you to do that. I just want to also come in. In Tacoma, uh, unlike Columbia, uh, we do not have hotel motel tax dollars that are going into the arts. Those funds are going to support the convention center, so we don't have any kind of consistent funding. That's why cultural access for Tacoma is really important. Okay, political uh, commercial done. How about you, sir? What would you like to say? Well, again, thank you very much for uh, enlightening us about us. Uh, very helpful. Again, I'm with the campus here, so I want to first mention something before I ask my questions. Uh, what I want to mention is that actually we have two Gary here, right in Philip Hall, right outside with our partnership with uh, TAM, uh, and, and we have a quarterly change of the arts. But the question to do with this is actually, I also set up, I'm actually an IT guy, so we set up digital arts as well, but often the, the monitor is, 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 is blank. As this is when you go out when you, before you go to pick up your lunchbox, there's nothing on it. This is not enough digital arts in the community, in my opinion, and because of my background. I don't know, this is one of the first questions, is can we set up, something to, set up something to encourage them and so on? We have 2D arts, 3D arts, and we even have a place for it. But I think even TAM probably doesn't have enough digital arts, therefore, because this is the extension of TAM, the paintings is changing regularly, quarterly basis, but not the digital arts piece. So, so that's one thing. Secondly, we also have a gallery downstairs. That is to be, uh, it's a partner with SOTA, you know, the School of Arts in Tacoma. That's also very important for our students, extension, what they, what they have they can display. But I think we can partner. I don't just want to see things on my campus here, right? So we need to see all over all the different community. We talk about the livable places, but we are one of them. We can partner with you. and and also extend all of that. My second question, the first one, I, maybe you can answer the digital, but I have the very quick, the second question is, why can't we, well, we have the museum district here, and, and often I think that, well, we have one day free, but why can't we team up, have a passport idea, why don't we, like if you go visit five, the sixth uh, museum, then you, or you get a 10% discount to visit all of them. Our students get discount, and I'm not advocating for faculty staff to get discount but, or, or the community, but we can get a discount if you visit all of them, or, or five or, out of the six or whatever. Or if you, if you stamp all the passport, you can get into a draw or things like that to promote a whole community together. Can we think of something like that, please? That's sure, question. I will respond to that. There is a museum pass that uh, is available, and there's a lot of collaboration happening within the museum district. Uh, ar around that. Now to digital arts and maybe to the other question that I might say is micro galleries and or uh, imbuing art into uh, non-gallery or museum spaces. Anybody want to comment on that? So I was going to answer his first question just briefly because I'm not qualified to answer it. <laughs> uh, but Certainly, um, I do think that digital arts are up and coming, and I think in terms of uh, what Tam might do to help with, with the gallery out here, I know they'd be very interested in doing that, so I'll pass that on, so that's my answer. <laughs> well, I think you're already partnering with Tam to do some of those spaces. If you want to extend the opportunity for digital, digital arts to more people, um, you could either talk to me or Heather Joy, who manages SpaceWorks. They have a great, um, great networks to connect with, with local artists who would love the opportunity to show new media and digital. Um, one of the one of the downfalls, or whatever, what, use a better word, but we don't have a lot of galleries or traditional galleries in Tacoma. Never have. That's been one of the. I hate to keep beating the drum, but that's part of why SpaceWorks was evolved. Also, is to increase opportunities for contemporary artists and, and artists in general to show their work in alternative spaces and to potentially maybe even um, influence uh, the insertion of, of new galleries. But we rely on on spaces like yours or coffee shops or um, one of our best. Uh, dentists has great shows, um, but we don't have a lot of opportunities for for artists to exhibit in town. So, until we get that, we're really grateful for for your willingness to participate in that. I'd like to say ecosystem. something about the passport. Um, our passport in Columbia comes out of our mayor's office, and they provide them for all the arts organizations. But what we have found has been absolutely unexpected is that children love these passports. And we're always talking about how to increase audiences. 
The kids love to get the stamp, the sticker, whatever it may be, and it's encouraging them to come over and over to get the different stickers and the different stamps. So if you haven't done the children's version, it's really exciting. Yes, sir. First, giving recognition to the First Nations people's land, which you're standing upon 150 years ago. The uh, salmon used to be in so much abundance. It was Tacoma versus the world, the production of coho salmon. Or, what a great resource. Um, a primer, how many, by show of hands, know about Willy Wonka and a chocolate factory? Okay. Has anyone ever been in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory environment besides Disneyland? Okay. Well, the city of Tacoma had an opportunity through, again, the Tacoma Green Infrastructure Challenge, dealing with stormwater. We designed a culturally relevant design called a Chinampa system, uh, a 2,000-year-old system to deal with stormwater. And we designed it around a cultural center, Metro Parks Center, Star Center, in a form of yin and yang, capturing water, but building the foodscape, the Willy Wonka, the, the theme in which to bring culture and people together for a variety of reasons, through baseball or through grandma just wants to go to pick her in-season hardy kiwi that would thrive here. So what opportunities through, uh, you presented some funding mechanisms and, and getting really the museum embedded into the landscape of communities because not everyone has an opportunity to come to the center, but to socially engage community, not only through meeting their needs, but priming the young generation about visioning and what, seeing what's possible. Is there a question in that? Yes. <laughs> How can we get Willy Wonka's chocolate factory built in the built landscape somewhere? So I just will comment on, you know, Tacoma Art Museum does a lot of uh, work around community festivals to more outreach and engage people. And one of the sculptures at the front of our museum, um, as in yours, mine, and ours, uh, is a, a wonderful uh, sculpture by Maria Watts, who's a Native American artist. And it's made of blankets. And blankets represent transport uh, in the Native American culture. And so she reached out to the community and said, bring us your blankets, your stories, and then constructed the sculpture. And it was bronze. So it's there forever. And you can go to the website and see the individual stories. And I think, uh, you know, to Karen's point, what we, what we have to do um, is really think outside the box and, and figure out ways to engage people at all levels of, from, you know, all backgrounds and all ages. Uh, and I, I know that, that, that Tam is very focused on doing that. And the Day of the Dead um, community festival started out very small numbers and it's well into the thousands now. So people do respond to that. And I would say at the Broadway Center, we're working really hard to take concerts and events, not only to the schools where we're serving 45,000 a year, but to communities. We have a small grant from uh, Pierce County Council, which was a miracle in and of itself, <laughs> um, to take uh, uh, programs and concerts and have them pop up in every uh, county council district so that folks don't have to come into downtown to enjoy good performances. Anybody else? I don't have the exact answer, except I, I did see your presentation to Metro Parks. I think we were in a meeting together at one time, and I, it just blew my mind. I mean, I look, see those things, and I'm like, how can we do it also? Um, but what you're proposing is really visionary and really interdisciplinary and, and um, will take persistence. But um, I think it's just building that momentum and being at the table. And who knows when the stars will align to make it be the right thing at the right time. But I commend you for the work you do and it's really admirable. I, I was very excited about it when I saw what you were up to. Hi, Sarah Luna, South Sound Military Communities Partnership. Do you have any programs that are outreach military specific for veterans or uh, for the military community itself? The, I can begin to answer that uh, while others are considering. Uh, the Broadway Center has done a number of programs to military audiences. Uh, we had a program that went out to uh, the hospital and brought uh, musical artists and engaged in healing and dexterity exercises for folks. Uh, we did a whole program um, uh, that was called Operation Homecoming in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts where we looked at stories of deployment and family connections. And then uh, most recently, we've been talking, I haven't quite gotten to the 
uh, execution of the model, but looking at using the technology that we've created around uh, student intervention and building relationships through the LENS project, the anti-bullying program, but using it uh, for uh, cohort development with uh, the advisor teams, the intake teams of the sexual harassment staff uh, at JBLM because they're very isolated and are dealing with tremendous amounts of intensity and pressure, and yet they haven't stitched together their own cohort system, nor have they figured out how best to tell their story collectively to the upper brass. And so we want to work with them to see if we can help them with that. Anybody else? Yeah, th there are several programs out there that are working within military arts and military programs. Um, and I know it, the Arts Endowment was, was a leader in setting those up a couple of years ago. Um, just when I heard about a, a couple of days ago, uh, Tom Skerritt, the local actor who based in Seattle, he has a program, I think it's called Red Badge, and he's teaching um, uh, people dramatic arts, teaching the vets dramatic arts as a way to, to, to help them um, express what they're really feeling that, 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 that they're keeping inside, and they find the dramatic arts are really helping them do that. Amy, can you talk about the Glass Museum? Yeah, I was going to say the Museum of Glass has a wonderful program um, specifically for vets where they, they're on the hotshot floor learning to blow glass, and that's been really successful. Um, SpaceWorks doesn't have a specific to vets, but inclusive of vets, and make sure that we let veterans know that if they are of a creative enterprise, that they can come through our program. And we've had about, I would say, five or six since the beginning of the program. Um, I don't know if there, I know that there are discounts and things, but there's, we would love to be more connected with the military community and, and any way to, to bring down those barriers are welcome, you know, communication. Now, in Colombia, we have the largest basic training base in America, in Colombia. And the challenge we have, we do all the wonderful things. We do the Blue Star Initiative, which offers free admission for military and their families from, Labor Day, from Memorial Day to Labor Day. National Endowment's been a part of that. The challenge we face is the turnover. People change very, very quickly. So once you get a program underway, it can easily fall back. Um, we had a robust program with the schools on the base. So we did educational programs with them. But then as soon as that changes, your third leg of the three-legged stool falls away and you have to rebuild it again. So if you go into it, just know that you're going to have a different challenges of staff and continuity. A changeover is mostly affected by changeover in leadership, right? Yes, sir. Yes, good morning. Thank you all for sharing your perspectives and your visions uh, with us this morning. Uh, my question has to do with um, the role that libraries should pay. Uh, we have, uh, you know, our libraries and library systems here in Pierce County uh, it seem that they would have uh, the potential and, and ought to aspire to be a part of this uh, livability in the arts uh, culture. Um, what should we expect from our library systems? Um, in Columbia, our public library is also nominated as one of the 15 finalists for the National Medal. We're the only city in America with two finalists, one in museums and one in libraries. So I said to the executive editor of the paper, do you think it's the drinking water? <laughs> <laughs> um, the library is also, the main branch is also one block from us. So I think it's a great question, and I think for all of you to think about your library, because when I served on the board of IMLS, there was a really interesting strategic question raised. And that was a simple question is, what do we do with all the buildings? And I didn't really know what that meant until we talked about it. They were saying when there basically are no longer books in these libraries, what do we do with all the real estate? You think that, gee, that's far-fetched. Well, there is a library in the United States with no books. It's in San Antonio. It's the first public library in the nation with no books. So what these libraries are doing, they're really embedding themselves in the community and creating ties for business development, for job, for job and resume development. And we work very closely with them on literacy. Because when you think about it, art museums, give small children the first things they look at. They look at books, but what do they see? Color, shape, line, texture. That's art in motion. 
And then once they learn to read, they can take it forward. So it's about learning to read. Read will help you learn. And that's how we partner with libraries. The Arts Commission gives awards in the community, and the library system was given a, a AMACAT award, to come up backwards, for arts and community engagement. Because um, they, not only in, in being libraries are important, but they, ha they do active programming, bringing a, a active gallery, bringing um, writers in, bringing performers in. Um, bringing uh, arts activities to different neighborhoods. The, things, the thing about libraries and our schools and our parks is that they get deeply into the community and they're all over. So if we can use those, when I talked about access, if you can go down to your neighborhood library and, and have a storytelling or hear a performance or see art or exhibit art, um, then that's getting to that access piece. So I think libraries are essential. The other thing um, that's cool in Tacoma, at least, is we have Tacoma Reads. So the um, city, well, the library is part of our city system, sort of. <laughs> um, they choose a book every year and encourage people to read that together. And it's a great way to, to have a dialogue around certain issues. Um, so libraries are, are essential and, and can't be lost in the greater cultural mix. And, I'll yeah. just echo that and uh, add a little bit to say that the Tacoma and the Pierce County uh, library systems, as Amy says, are so deeply integrated into neighborhoods, but they are also an opportunity for intergenerational connection, more so than almost any place else. And I think that's something that we have to emphasize, that the libraries can be conveners of multi-generational connections and mentoring. Um, over here. Hi, Jim Bilbao. Would you please talk a little bit about how social media has changed your perspective of what's possible and what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going about it? I personally have never been a stronger uh, advocate of the arts and patron of the arts and, and a more fervent consumer of the arts since I figured out how to find it all on Facebook. <laughs> That's where I'm so enthralled with my favorite artists and I'm involved. And I, I, maybe it's not a, maybe I'm not unique in that respect. So what are your perspectives? I think you answered your own question. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, uh, a lot of it has to do with access and uh, the ability to create a personal connection. And I think that social media allows for that. It also, in a strange way, allows it to be okay to be interested in, in arts and artists and et cetera, because you have friends that share that common interest. So there's a, a great deal of um, opportunity with that type of marketing uh, and promotion because it has sort of a swarm effect. Um, and I think that, you know, for arts institutions, I, I, somebody earlier mentioned that, you know, they had food trucks pull up and they would send it out as a tweet and suddenly the line is now 60 people. So it's a very powerful uh, media. Um, I think too that to Karen's earlier point, you know, in, in terms of presenting uh, the material for a museum, that's something that is constantly being considered is how do you interact, you know, the, the new media with the old media um, because it's certainly not going away. It's being consumed more and more. I'd like to add a nuance to the question for uh, museum folks particularly, but it has an effect on uh, performing arts as well. Uh, the explosion of uh, access to art over media and internet and social media uh, has driven a sense of self-curation. We can all dial in exactly who we, what, who we want to see, who we appreciate. How is that self-curation affecting a professional curation? Uh, the IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services that we've talked about, created a study, it's online, and it's called 21st Century Learning in Museums and Libraries. And what's important about that is the 20th century was the century of the, the curator as the PhD as basically the person who knows the most about the subject, and they are going to tell you what you don't know. So there's a one-way transaction, and the 21st century has now equalized that voice, sometimes to the very big chagrin of curators. <laughs> um, and they are now not so much as the authority as they are a trusted voice. This is a sea change in museums. 
because again, if you remember my opening comments about the object, those are what these curators spend their life knowing about objects. So now to have someone in this audience say, well, here's what I think about this object is almost, could be conceived as a direct attack on their scholarship and connoisseurship. So what we're doing, the Metropolitan is doing, is saying it's not an attack on your knowledge, but here's a chance for you to share your knowledge with a much wider audience in a warm and welcoming way. So it's a chance for professional growth for some of these curators, and I've seen it work. Um, the Met does this brilliantly. Um, they have 80 people in their social media area at the Met, in, in Met Museum. Um, we have a half a person. Um, but what we've taken on, we do something, if you check out our website, columbiamuseum.org, we have something called CMA Stories. And we're making little movies about artists and our audiences. They're about a minute, two minutes long. And we post them because we want people to get a window to what we're doing, again, beyond the object, but how people relate to the object. So the other thing is technology is super expensive, so we're trying to figure that out too. I'll just say at the Broadway Center, we have uh, tried to find the balance between uh, self-curation and uh, professional curation. And so we use Facebook in a reverse engineering way, right? So we go in as though we're gonna lay out an ad in Facebook to see if a particular audience has an audience within a 30 minute drive time. And then that helps inform knowing that there's relevance out there for the artists that we might bring in. So that's one way. And then annually we send out a massive uh, overlong uh, survey that says, hey, if we brought this artist, what do you think? So everybody has a voice in the curation that we do. Yes, sir. Hi, um, my name's Terry. I'm uh, 50 years old. Uh, I grew up in Montana and I love Western art. Uh, with that said, there's just too much white art in Tacoma. And if I feel that way at my age, uh, there probably is too much white art in Tacoma. Um, I have a favor to ask. Uh, does any of the panelists have ever heard of Hoop Fest in Spokane? Yep. It, uh, 10,000 three-man basketball teams descend on Spokane for this crazy weekend of basketball. Uh, I would like Tacoma to have an arts festival, and whatever arts festival you're thinking about, it, it's not big enough. Bigger, bigger. <laughs> and please, can we, can we have just one weekend where Tacoma is the shining star of art in the whole West Coast? Thank you. Yes. You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Other comments? Okay. So the question about um, military families and their temporary status made me realize in a community meeting, you hear the same thing about renters and neighborhoods and their temporary status. And so I was wondering, listening to you, if um, they're really, not, no one's temporary, everyone's living. And so back to the livability question, you may be able to do a test case here and think maybe how you respond to this, but Columbia and Tacoma, both university cities, both military bases. And you know, coming from, with a military family background, they wanna connect and they plan for connections. We, when we move, we plan. And the arts and culture might have a way to address, and this gives, could get back to politics, but knitting our country back together again. Because what better place than if you provide a link between all your small towns or towns that have the military bases, that have the universities. So people who are connected in Tacoma, they're not just a, a temporary. They know that they are along a path. I would say, uh, just to get the juices going on that, that um, it is about leadership within the uh, universities. It is about leadership within the military bases. Uh, they are both, uh, by nature, silo, uh, keep us together, connect us, don't tread out of the zone here because, you know, you, you, we may lose you. Um, and I would say that that is one of the most powerful things about the University of Washington Tacoma is that the urban serving 
position that they have taken is very focused about getting students and faculty uh, out into the community. And that's uh, a way that the cultural organizations, I think, are ready, willing, and able to serve and partner. But we need the door open. And it's sometimes difficult to get the door open. Anybody else? Yeah, I would just say, and I, you know, just a reminder, I'm actually a volunteer at the Tacoma Art Museum, and I have zero to do with operations. Our fine president, Steve Harlow, who's the president of our board, is here today, so I just want to um, state that. <laughs> uh, but I think that what you just spoke to is all the more reason that we have to invest in our uh, arts and cultural institutions so that we can do amazing and creative programs that, you know, lift up our communities. And I think that, um, you know, your assessment of is anybody really temporary, you know, I'd like to say no. I, I agree with you. And I think that if there are ways that we can work with the leadership at the, at the base and with the leadership of our arts and cultural institutions in the city um, and have the capacity to create programs such as that, you know, we will all benefit from that. Hi, I'm Marianne Seifert from the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. I have two quick things. Um, one, a lot of things we've talked about today remind, reminded me of a webinar I saw last week, and it's called Creative Placemaking. It's from uh, Transportation for America, t4america.org. Did you see that webinar? It was oh, awesome. Yeah. And I think we could use some of those things to build on, like the mural program that in C uh, City of Tacoma and many of the other projects, and also to build partnerships with the military bases, take art out into the communities. They, they created this like giant puppet to talk about this cafe that was being, um, their economic development was being impacted by a construction project. I mean, they, all these great examples. Um, so I'd like to promote that uh, webinar. It's uh, t4america.org. And another thing is, um, how can we do a better job involving youth? I think um, I used to, in my previous incarnation, I was a pottery teacher and professional potter, and we worked with at-risk youth, and we were really able to connect through clay, and it was so powerful. And, I, and we see uh, kids not graduating from high school, kids struggling, you know, with many issues. Maybe that's related to the homeless situation too. You know, is there some way we can all work together? better as a university, as a health department, as big institutions, to really get our youth more engaged and graduating from high school through art. Yeah, we can help to uh, put the arts back into the schools. That's, a, that's a, been a real problem. <laughs> I'll just say that uh, through uh, the Foundation for Tacoma Students and the collaboration with the Tacoma School District, they are a leading edge in the United States about using community partnerships, including and deeply including cultural organizations to skyrocket the graduation rate as we've seen here in Tacoma. And there is a lot going on that you may not be seeing, but is out there in the fabric of the schools where cultural institutions are making an enormous difference. So is it enough? No. I would also add in South Carolina, we have a program run under the auspices of our Arts Commission at Winthrop University, and it's called Arts and Basic Curriculum. And it's to Sue's point, we have 46 schools, um, mostly elementary and middle, but it's where the arts is infused back into the curriculum, and it's from the top down, from the principal superintendents down. It's a pilot project that's been around for 20 years, so it's starting to take hold. And so check that out, Arts and Basic Curriculum. I'm just, if I may, David, I'll be very oh, quick. I just want to uh, emphasize how important it is to get the arts back in school. You know, as a mother of two children, uh, my daughter is very much on the art side, and my son is very much on the math side. But what's important in schools is that we teach the whole children, you know, the whole child. We can't say, take these young creative minds and then put them through this rote channel and put out good workers. You know, a lot of the dissatisfaction, I think, that uh, we have with our youth is that they, you know, they're not fulfilling everything about who they are. And I think it's just a, it's a sad day when we don't have arts equally presented in our schools with everything else, so I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and not to uh, diss the uh, technology person at the table at all, because I think the arts also get uh, students away from their media devices in a, in a very powerful uh, way. Yes. 
Hi, I'm Elisa O'Hanlon, longtime Tacoma resident, first time Urban Studies Forum participant, and I happen to be a colleague of Amy's at the City of Tacoma, although in a different department. And I've heard the threads of my thoughts, um, but I'd like to hear more of your thoughts about um, how to get more of um, the arts into our everyday life and how to make our established institutions more available to those arts that I would characterize as um, lesser recognized as arts, so like culinary art or even hip hop music. And one of the comments you made, Amy, was for example, we have, um, we have a lack of gallery space. Um, so we do take advantage of coffee shops. And I am grateful that we take advantage of coffee shops because frankly, I'm not gonna go into a gallery, but I do go into Karina Bakery and that's how I get exposed to some of, of that visual art. Um, and, and, and the other thought I had was, for example, my teenager, um, very much into music, goes over to her friend's house. They are able, through their computers and other technology that they have available to them, to dabble in music. But it, there is no public, I mean, they could go anytime to the Tacoma Art Museum or the LeMay Museum and they can see things, but the art that they practice is this music mixing at home. And so is there a way to kind of elevate some of those arts that the young people are active in um, and, um, and make our institutions that are already dedicated to some of these other things, um, you know, quite solidly and regularly, how to make it available to the other arts that a lot of our youth are. So it's the cross-pollination that I'm right. trying to characterize. And it's, it's a constant uh, challenge, but part of, when I was talking about the uh, flourishing creative ecosystem and I talk about diversity, a variety of art forms are expressed and experienced, that's part of us opening up our own minds and saying, oh, culinary arts is creative expression. Hip hop, of course, is an art form. How, singing in, in your church is an art form. I mean, it's, it's breaking the boundary down between our own implicit bias of what is cu culturally acceptable and what is art all around us. We, um, when we started to come Arts Month, it was, it was called Art at Work because the whole point was that arts are at work everywhere, they're, they're part of everything, but it, we have to almost say it explicitly and then follow up with, okay, where does that get to happen? How do we you know, continue to partner with, with Metro Park so they do X, Y, and Z, and where, you know, where are the gaps that we need to be filling, of course? I mean, uh, not, SpaceWorks is, is a creative enterprise. You have a good idea? I mean, some of the clients are, um, makeup or, you know, body scrubs and fingernail polish that isn't toxic and, um, you know, t-shirt makers and all kinds of folks that are, that are not necessarily a traditional artist making a painting, but they're bringing their creativity to bear and their talent. And so those, those are other ways that you say, a skateboard shop, you know, I mean, it's, it, and it's, and it is so integrated into our community that people don't necessarily look at that and say, oh, that's art, but we need to we need to look at where creativity is everywhere and we need to know that it is everywhere and that we embrace it and it isn't just in that institution or that institution. So it's definitely a philosophy we're approaching. There's always, you know, that flourishing creative ecosystem has some gaps, but, you know. That's what we need. Yes. Um, I would just say that's what cultural districts do. They create a goal of keeping people in a vibrant center for 24-7. Um, so I, I would really encourage if you could get that done. Um, it's really economic development, but it's also about these other forms. We did a program called Skate and Create, um, working with the local um, skateboarders in Columbia, and they came and, and decorated um, their skateboards, and we showed them at the museum. And it cr you couldn't believe the diversity in, inside the museum, both from youth, race, gender, you name it. It was really incredible. So I think you just have to take that leap and see what comes out of it. Thank you for teeing up that question. We uh, at the Broadway Center today have three shows of hip hop uh, and all three sold out, um, two thirds of them serving students. Uh, and these, this is a program <coughs> called Black Violin uh, with two African American uh, artists who are astounding and they are merging classical music so they go from Bach to hip hop and unbelievable. One more question. Get closer to the microphone. The volumes of 
street art and gr thank you. I can't help but think that the volumes of street art and graffiti are indicative of a lack of creative outlets for our youth and perhaps, un, perhaps untapped resources. Can you speak to maybe how the arts community is addressing that or how we could perhaps improve on addressing that? Uh. Sorry, Amy, I think that's got your name on it, yeah. Uh, well, you know, for a number of years, the city partnered with a private developer um, to re-engage the, the graffiti garages downtown, and there were this, was this amazing space where people could could paint. The artists who wanted to paint could paint. Um, that was closed down for a number of reasons, and it's been a hard uh, hard road to try to find another space that could be free and and a, a, a free space for graffiti. Um, it's definitely a piece, you know, we thought when we, when we uh, developed that as a strategy to um, allow those who want to be perfecting their aerosol art craft that they could do that in a safe place and not feel the need to vandalize. It's not the be all and end all answer um, at all. They, the, the, the artists were getting vandalized by other taggers that were more about the vandalism and the destruction than they were about the art form. So I certainly learned a whole mess of layers of, of code and violation. And you know, I don't just mean city code, I mean graffiti code. Um, and even that, you know, oh, people just need to be educated or they're just the youth. Well, a lot of the people are 40-year-old people that I know that are working artists or, or go to the School of the Arts or things like that. So it leads me to think of, you know, it's not just about the graffiti, but it is about what, what is it that this means and how do, you know, I don't know the answer. I used to, we went down a path that I thought was the answer. Um, so now I'm kind of scratching my head about what is it, because it, it definitely, you know, it's telling us something, what is it and what are the real things that can provide um, outlet for people. And, and there are people who just like to vandalize and I call them knuckleheads and, you know, we're not gonna solve all of that. But for the ones who, who, um, who like to use that style of artwork, you know, I want to see it celebrated. It's it's beautiful. It's been around for 40 years. Come on, people. You know, it's, let's let's have it where we can. So I don't know if that's a good answer. It's just it's definitely a struggle. Thank you. I would like to end by saying uh, maybe you could all consider your role if you feel that there is value in what the cultural community is doing. Uh, we are beginning to break through the political barrier of being dismissed, the uh, 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 leadership barrier within government of being dismissed, uh, and really feeling uh, a sense of uh, respect and support uh, from uh, those leadership systems in a way that uh, I think is new. Uh, but I think the more you all can speak up and speak to, uh, encouraging more support, more creative uh, engagement from government and from uh, corporate leadership, uh, the bigger impact we're all going to be able to turn and deliver back uh, to the community overall. I want to thank the panel uh, for uh, being here and all their support, particularly those that traveled so far, Karen and Sue, thank you, and, because we know how far it is from Seattle uh, to Tacoma. <laughs> And it's only half as far from Tacoma to Seattle. Did you know that? Um, thank you all, and I'll turn it over to Ali.